Hey everyone, welcome to my Fragmapedium Karen Weaver much neglected revamp and cleanup and story time. Before we get into this project though, let me show you something. So I put my Garen Weaver on my little filming station here and of course filled it up, let it soak and check all these flipping ants out because clearly having flooded the pot, I may have disturbed their nest. But they're now going back into the hedge, carrying lots and lots of little things. So let's see what's going on in this pot. This orchid needs a lot of help. It has been neglected. Oh, the shame, the shame. We'll take care of it now and then we'll see how it goes. This is interesting. Jumbo Karibuni, welcome to the patio. Hello, hello, hello. Yes, we have ourselves an ant's nest in this pot. So if you're squeamish about ants, I will put in timestamps and we'll clarify everything that is going on with this repot cleanup on revamp of my Garen Weaver. It is a super busy day beyond the hedge, but it is also a not windy day and it is a now or never day. If I don't get this done now, it'll all be a little bit too late. So what I'm doing here now is just blasting off the ants that I can see on the surface. And then we're going to go in and get the orchid out, do a regular cleanup, check out the roots, which I think could be a little bit dismal, and leaf cleanup and all of that stuff. And today, as part of my story time, we are going by train from Mombasa to Nairobi. So hop on to the Choo Choo Chongululu train and join me for my African story while I clean up my Garen Weaver from Mombasa to Nairobi. I'll start the story once I've got this orchid out of the pot. I think it's gonna be war. It's gonna be, yep. Oh my goodness, you guys, there are ants in here galore. Let's see if we can just do it like this. And if that helps at all. Nope, I'm going to get my hammer. Three seconds to skip forward for about 30 seconds if you're squeamish about ants. Well, I guess I owe these guys an apology. They're moving out. This is a root system that's been untouched for a year. And yes, there's a lot of decay and dead in it, but there's also branching root tips and that is what I'm interested in. And also to clean up everything and make her look a little bit better but check this out hmm i will focus on my story while i take care of this <laughs> welcome back if you had to skip forward if you didn't want to see ants everywhere i understand i am going to also be constantly brushing my hands as they start to crawl and protest at having been disturbed but Let's go to the Mombasa train station. It's approximately 6.30 in the evening. It's quite hot actually, very, very humid. Oh my goodness. And the hustle and the bustle of everybody trying to get their baggage, locate their porters, go to their designated wagons. Train leaves at 7 p.m. And we have a 13 hour ride through Kenya, 7 p.m. We get to sleep on the train, have dinner and tea and all that good stuff. But before we do that, we need some mandazis. 
mandazis at the train station being cooked right there, all hot. And mandazis are the African donut. It's just a mixture of flour, water, a bit of yeast, some milk, sugar, <laughs> and then tossed into boiling oil. They also call it African fried bread or Swahili bun. If you want to get fancy, we didn't because at the time it was unheard of, but you want to get fancy, you can make the coconut milk as opposed to regular milk. All that good stuff. Oh, and they're so delicious and they poof up. And so they look like a samosa and they're sort of triangular. Oh, but they're just delicious and you have to have mandazis as a snack on the train before dinner, as you do. But yum. So we get those and the air is filled with all the aromas the corn being roasted on open coals, literally just husks of corn, and they peel back the husk and then they lay the corn on there, and all this is wafting through the air in the heat, in the humidity. Lots going on. I traveled second class a lot because second class cabins had six bunks, and if there was a group of us all going from half term, midterm back to school, my school having been in the Rift Valley Academy and I lived in Mombasa at the coast. Usually I had maybe a gaggle of friends with me for half term and then we would take a second class cabin and there would be maybe four of us in the cabin, sometimes only three, but we all wanted to be like together. So we got a second class cabin even if there were some bunks still available. And sometimes I traveled first class, especially when it was me alone going from, you know, term to term when no, no friends were joining me. And then I would be in first class and that was like two bunks. And it was a, I remember light blue leather, second class was brown leather. And it was just a fabulous time. So anyway, I'm gonna just consider the memories I have regarding traveling with or on my own. I'll just mix and mash them up. But of course, if you're traveling with friends, it's all very exciting and you find your cabin, you get settled in and, you know, all the bunks are kind of folded up. So you're sitting down and then all of a sudden you hear that roar of the engine going, the Kenya railways, amazing. And then bit by bit, it starts to pull out of the station. Not the Swiss style efficient, quiet kind of gliding motion. No, it starts to shake and rattle and then slowly you're being pulled and then there's all these little children still trying to make their last minute sails running along the train. Well, because it's not going fast, they can. Yelling at you, come on, come on, please buy, please buy. You know, but by that time you've already got all the goodies and you've kind of stocked up. So, but it's so fun, they're smiling faces, waving, and we'd all wave out. We don't even know each other, but everybody's waving, having a great time. And um, yeah, at this age, when I was doing these train rides, I was maybe from 13, well, to graduation, to 18. And when you think back, can you imagine the security? Leaving a 13-year-old to travel with a gaggle of other 13, 14-year-olds in a train? for 13 hours overnight to get to Nairobi to catch a bus, to go to school. Unimaginable this day and age. It would not happen, but it is so much fun. So by 7 p.m. when the train leaves the station, you see Mombasa being on the coast, you have to really imagine getting an old train up the hills and into the plateau area of inland Kenya. It was slow going, but you know, you could be leaning out the window, talking to people on the roadside with jumbo, jumbo. And they would be shouting Zungu, Zungu, which means white person. Zungu, Zungu. And we were all just, oh, it was so much fun. Anyway, but you would be trundling, literally trundling. You wonder, is this train going to go backwards or is it going to actually make it up the hills? <laughs> past the palm trees, under sounds, the smells, the huts that you see. The typical back in the day when, I don't know how it is now, but you know, the thatched roof grass huts, the cows, the women dressed in their colorful kikois and having the baskets on their head, being it with water troughs or 
maybe a banana bunch on the head as well. Anyway, so you're going up and you're also passing a lot of coconut tree plantations. So all this is going on. And it's about maybe 8.30 or something. Let's say you're traveling first class. There's a gong that goes around. The typical, as you can imagine in a movie, kind of gong, bong. And you can hear it coming from the distance. And as it approaches the first class wagons, it just keeps bong, bong. And then it gets louder and louder as it passes your wagon because that is a call for dinner time. And, you know, I would like to say, well, you know, we dressed fancy and went for dinner or no, we didn't. Um, kids being kids, I, I had what I was wearing and that was just about it. <laughs> and usually it was just shorts, flip flops and a shirt because of the humidity in Mombasa. It's just, there's no way of getting fancy because the train is not air conditioned. <laughs> so it's not like, you know. It's not like the Orient Express with Hercule Poirot, no way. But still, dinner time, that means there was something to do, something to explore. We could get out and off to dinner we went and we sat there and we were, we were served by some, you know, the staff is so nice and welcoming. And to be honest, at that age, I didn't even recognize if there were tourists around or who was around. None of that mattered. It wasn't a point of interest to see. For me, it was more about getting the menu, having a look, and then choosing between your fish and your meat. There wasn't this thing about alternative meals. It was what was on the menu. Of course, there was no alcohol. I mean, the staff was trained enough to do that and know about that. It just felt fancy. And then trundling with the train, watching the countryside go by, watching the atmosphere and then the light change across the sky and, and how the countryside changed with the light. It became almost like a, an amber, a golden topaz color before night set in. Just amazing, amazing. But by the time we had dinner, it was nighttime because, you know, being on the equator, it's a 12 hour day and the sun comes up at 6.30 and sets at 6.30, but there's still that amber glow. It's just beautiful, beautiful. And anyway, so dinner time, and then of course it was like, you know, water or Fanta orange was one of my favorite drinks. Don't come to me with all the fresh orange juices, which wasn't that big a deal for me. I was more a pineapple juice person and uh, always have been a pineapple juice person, but it was, you know, the water and Fanta. My age group loved Coca-Cola. The only reason I would drink Coca-Cola was to annoy my mom because she had banned it from the house. I was only allowed one Coca-Cola every Sunday. Oh, all sorts of things. But for me, Fanta orange, and back in the day, the Fanta orange was orange. The color even was orange, not this pale stuff that you see in the shops today. I love that stuff. So I got to drink as much Fanta orange at dinner as I wanted to. And I even got to take some back to my cabin. But anyway, and then after dinner, you can sit and you still have some tea. And then, but you know what? Oh, wait, wait, you know what? The cutlery and even the coffee and all that, it's, it's still that sterling silver heavy stuff that when you touch the pot, it's hot. So a lot of people seem to think that when our staff wore gloves in Kenya, it was... It was nothing more but the fact that the things that we were using, pots and stuff, it was hot to the touch. So when they served and presented tea or coffee, hot water, for example, even, it was all in sterling silver stuff and that was hot and that's why staff wore gloves. No other reason, none of this other stuff that we're hearing today. But yeah, and everything was, you know, beautifully, decorated with the logo of the Kenya Railway. Fantastic. But anyway, so we, you know, we had our tea and uh, our dessert, and then we went back into the cabin. And by that time, the, the beds had been turned and the bunks were down and beds had been made, beautiful sheets. 
again, not as stylish or classy as, let's say, the Orient Express, but it was pretty impressive that, you know, while you were at dinner, staff would go around and make your beds. And this would be in first class. And I'm talking in second class. We didn't really get much sleep because I was traveling with friends and there would be a lot of hoopla <laughs> in our cabin. So it wasn't like we were getting much sleep. But in first class, it was amazing to get into fresh beds and the top bunk. You had to kind of climb up these little stairs to get up onto the top bunk and then lie down, even though we weren't sleep very fast and let that train just rock you and that motion and then you had your window open quite a bit because it's so hot and humid still but there you were just in your bed and you stared up and through the window at the african night sky as the train took you through the night into Nairobi. But before that, we had to reach a station which, where there was a stop. And if you were asleep by that time, you'd be rudely awoken because, and that was called Voy. So Voy was uh, maybe a car drive of two, three hours from Mombasa by car, a little bit longer with the train. Can you believe it? But that would be like at around midnight, I believe, that you would reach Voy and we would be awake anyway. The train would stop and all the little kiddos would come out again, trying to sell their wares to the travelers. And if by that time we had run out of mandazis, we went out and got ourselves some more mandazis. And strict instructions in a way from the parents to not leave the train at any given point in time. But who cares? We were young, we were 13. There was no danger. If there had been a danger, then don't send a 13-year-old on a train ride through Africa all by themselves or with a friend. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> anyway, so boy, and then they'd come along and they would be banging against the trusses of the train just to check, you know, just to check if everything was solid and in place where it should be. And these noises that are so typical that I now if I, if I ever watch a movie again and come across something like that, it's a complete flashback because I am right back in Kenya listening to all this. And then the, the steam and, and just the noises and the hustle and bustle. And by that time in Voy, uh, I wouldn't say it was much cooler. Even at night, it wasn't cooler, but there was less humidity. So that by that time, you know you had reached a certain altitude, which was awesome because then you could put a pair of jeans on. I didn't sleep with pajamas on the train. I couldn't be bothered. <laughs> My luggage was elsewhere and I just had to carry on and I wasn't doing all this dress up, dress down business. So, but I did have a pair of jeans on because if you're still awake, by the time you reach boy, you are actually already sort of enjoying having a sheet over you as you lie in bed as opposed to just lying on the sheet when you leave Mombasa after dinner. It's, uh, the temperatures are quite different, I would say. Anyway, moving on. So you leave Boy and this whole thing starts again and the train is just like, am I gonna get there? Am I gonna get there? <laughs> oh, it's fantastic. Anyway, if you look out of the window, and this is what I was saying earlier, it's called Changolulu. The Mombasa train it was called Changululu, and Changululu is a kind of an insect to that. It's like a millipede, black with red legs. Then all the legs go in like a ripple as it moves along. If you touch it, it curls itself up and it looks like some kind of a dessert. I can't even remember the name now, but it's like a doughy dessert that is all curled up in a circle like that. And the Changululu would do that which is a millipede. That's what we would call the Mombasa train because it was, apart from the first class wagons, which were blue, if I remember correctly, they were blue on the outside with yellow on the logo, but the rest of the train was black. So everybody just called it Tungululu, like that millipede. Anyway, if you look out, then once you get to Voy, apart from the straight line, it starts to curve and you look out the window and if it's curving your way, you can see the front of the train and if you're somewhat in the middle, you can look back and you see the lights of the rest of the train. And then the magical dark 
pitch black African skies. The stars, the stars in those areas of the world where there is no light pollution. Watch the Southern Cross and it's just, uh, and then the, the train, the, the, add the noise of the train. The whole thing. I used to do these train trips. Let me count. Well, don't worry. I'm not going to count. Never mind. Let's say eight times a year. Maybe there would be an occasion that I would have to fly to Nairobi because of time constraints, because my dad's ship arrived later and I had to get to school or whatever it was. But um, eight, at least eight. <laughs> and then you just, you just marvel at the fact that you could do that on your own and not be supervised and it was safe. That's the one thing I just, this day and age, gosh, when I went with my children to Kenya, I did not leave them out of my sight by the pool or at the crash. I made sure I knew their whereabouts all the time. And I don't know if that, I don't know if that didn't factor in with my parents. I don't know. My dad was at sea. He probably only heard about it afterwards. But anyway, I don't care. I was so happy to travel alone. Meanwhile, I also traveled to Germany alone when I was little with overnight stays in Brussels. So 13-hour train trip through Kenya, big deal, whoop de doo <laughs> Anyway, eventually you do fall asleep because that, you know, rocking of the train is just, it's very calming and very soothing, although it is noisy, but you do fall asleep. It's amazing. And then you get rocked to sleep and then being tucked under a sheet because now it's a little bit cooler. It's not as humid. So a sheet is really, really nice. And eventually at some point, maybe at four or five o'clock in the morning, you kind of wake up because you're kind of cold. And then you kind of grab for the little wool blanket that they have when they initially make your bed before you take it all apart so you can handle the heat while you're still in the coastal area. And then there's the wool thing and then you kind of wake up because it's a little bit more chilly than you're accustomed to. And you know, <laughs> yeah, that little wool blanket serves really well. The wool blankets were really nice, by the way. And um, thinking back, dang, why didn't I get one as a souvenir? Really fluffy, beautiful wool blankets, also with the logo of the Kenya Railways on it. Fantastic. Anyway, but then you go back to sleep because it's so cozy, you know, a fresh breeze coming in through the window, of the trains. Awesome, just awesome. And you rock back to sleep until bong, bong. <laughs> very close to your door because you don't hear it as loud as you would hear it at, in the evening when you're awake, the breakfast gong goes around the first class trains, calling everybody up and getting everybody to wake up because breakfast will be served shortly. And that is normally at around, well, starting 5.30, 6 o'clock. And uh, if it's not daylight, you're not getting me out of bed. <laughs> so I waited 6.30. It was amazing. And then you just brushed your teeth in that little sink there, feeling a little wobbly, like from the train rocking. And, you know, it's all a little bit awkward and makeshift, but brush your teeth and do all that stuff. And I was always sort of a kid that wanted to leave a good impression. So I straightened my bed out and propped my pillow up and then folded the sheet back onto the bedding, you know, the, the wool blanket. And then I made like a triangle there. So, you know, it looks like I've been slept in, but out of respect. I don't know. I've always been that way. I wanted my beds to look really, really good, especially if I'm not in my own space and somebody else has to do something for me or it's their job to do something. I don't know. I just feel so much better if somebody walks into a room and says, oh, hey, now there's no towels on the floor. You know, like today in the hotels, leave the towels on the floor if you're checking out. I don't behave that way in my home. Yeah, anyway. Anyway, so yeah, yeah, get, let's get to breakfast. Let's get to breakfast. Chai, we need ourselves some of that chai, super sugary sweet chai. And then, of course, if we had no more mandazis, we bought some in Voi and had our stash of mandazis that we could also enjoy at breakfast. Sweet mandazis, sugary sweet chai. Heaven, you dunk. 
the mandazis, they were like, you know, like I mentioned, little triangles. They used to be that size. They're probably about a third of that now. But anyway, you need to dunk them into the tea and everything at the end is just one yum gulp of sugar. <laughs> Uh, maybe one day I'll do a video on how to make proper Kenya chai. <laughs> yeah, anyway, take the greasy bag of mandazis over to the table. Beautiful white linen is all spread out. You've got your cups and your and the, the sugar. No cubes. <laughs> That's fancy stuff. We didn't have cubes in Kenya. The white sugar was there in its beautiful silver little receptacle with its silver spoon. Oh, and you could smell all this going on in the kitchen from toast and then they brought the toast you know the toast stand with the little toasts all in a line everything is silver even even the cutlery had the logo of kenya railways on it i doubt any of that exists at this stage day and age i doubt it it probably it's just people have taken and walked off with it and now things are a little bit more commercialized but back then it really really was a touch of class loved it but yeah and then they come around they ask you what kind of breakfast you want because everything else just came to the table as you sat down you didn't have to ask for toast you didn't have to ask for butter even the milk is was hot hot milk and that's why they wear gloves they have to bring the sterling silver and there's hot milk in there so yeah no i'm telling you delicious and i mean the train arrives in nairobi at 8 a.m in the morning given that there's nothing happening that's bad or, you know, nothing, no delays along the way, so to speak. And then the, the, the air has changed, let's say, overnight, clearly. We're now on the tracks for about 11 hours. We've reached a certain altitude where we were way, way far away from the coast. And now there is a heat, but the mornings are so fresh and cool that you would actually think as a child of the coast, you, 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 you're cold, you know, so I didn't have any sweaters on at that time because we'd just gotten out of bed and it was all nice and warm and we were going to get ourselves some nice chai. We just sat there and the outskirts of Nairobi is already the a national park with wild animals. So while you're having breakfast, you can see impalas, gazelles, antelopes, maybe a warthog maybe even an ostrich racing the train. <laughs> an ostrich racing the train. I mean, okay, shame. The animals are spooked to a degree they should be used to it. But, they, you know, this huge steel giant comes at you, chuffing and huffing and puffing and this steam going everywhere and I don't know what. And then you'd see ostriches running around as if they've lost their minds. The warthogs were the funniest, though. And you saw a little family of warthogs having been disturbed while the train comes through with their little tails when they run, like, like little antennas going through the savannah. Just amazing. I mean, around the tracks, everything's cleared out. So you've got the gravel and everything. And then maybe there's, a, there's like a perimeter from before the bush starts. But the bush itself wasn't heavy, thick jungle trees. No, it was just brush and shrubs that were low, they're like thorny shrubs. So you could really see animals. I mean, the big animals didn't come very, very close. You'd see a lot of guinea fowl, a lot of dick dicks, little tiny little deer, the, the smallest deer of the world, a dick dick. Too cute, too cute. When you've seen a dick dick up close, you want to have them in your home. I mean, isn't it typical? We want to domesticate everything. They are adorable. They're these tiny, tiny little gray animals that are just adorable with teeny, tiny little black horns. Fabulous. It's those kinds of things that you would see scuttling around and before they disappear into the little thorn bushes there, you know. Sometimes you'd see a giraffe in the distance and the sky is waking up from a golden blue mix to all of a sudden being bright blue and gorgeous and yeah everything everything just sort of wakes up and you wake up because of all the sugar in your chai <laughs> and the mandazis <laughs> and then you'd be off to your cabin to sort of settle in for the ride into Nairobi train station which ah it's just 
incredible. When you think that you're, you're in a park and then you reach the outskirts of Nairobi, you're still in a park, and then you see kids and cars and not a lot. Back in that times, it wasn't like there was a lot of any of that going on. There was a lot of more activity though from whence you just came. <laughs> and you knew you were reaching civilization when the train started to slow down <laughs> even more. <laughs> we're talking 800 kilometers, 13 hours. So that's the distance between Nairobi and Mombasa, 800 kilometers and uh, yeah, overnight. <laughs> but anyway, where was I? Oh yeah, when the train starts to slow down even more, <laughs> cracks me up. But that would, you, you'd realize that you are now in civilization and um, you know, some, some rules started to apply again. And we'd just be hanging out the window watching the world go by slowly, even slower, trundling into Nairobi train station. And then all the kiddos would come running again. Mzungu, mzungu, mzungu. Sometimes, sometimes they would laugh at you for talking back to them in Swahili. They would be like, eh? <laughs> eh? <laughs> They'd be feel like a little bit intimidated, but yeah. Mzungu on the outside, but definitely, definitely Nativo on the inside. Well, yeah, I was born there, so it's my home. And people used to think of me as a tourist, and I would sit and then listen to them talk in their language, be it English, German, or let's say even a Kenyan talking in Swahili, and I could pick up on all these conversations, <laughs> and I could just blend in with whatever. Oh, it was so, so much fun. Yeah, but then again, when once you arrive, that's it. I mean, you know, get your luggage, wait for the porter to bring you your luggage, which is designated to cabin XYZ. So you wait, either you wait outside on the platform or you wait in your cabin until such a time that you've been told that your luggage is now on the platform, right by the door, whichever. I prefer to sit and wait. I've always been the kind of person, oh, let all the bustle go. Just, just go, I'll wait. You know, the luggage is not going to come any quicker because you're standing at the belt. But anyway, yeah, so you get your luggage and then you go outside and all of a sudden that adventure is over and there is your teacher with a, you know, Rift Valley Academy sign to congregate all the kiddos that were coming off that train, which weren't many. <laughs> Usually it was just myself. <laughs> Or again, if it was half term, that would also include some of my classmates. But hey, it was all very organized. Being a boarding school, they needed to know who was coming off the train to make sure they had a proper head count. But if there's only three or one, you know, not that difficult, I would say. But still, yeah. And then there was the teacher. And then we got into our, what did we call it? The Rosa van. And I don't know why it was called the Rosa van, but it was the smaller van, even though they could have just come with a single car, but no, it had to be the official van of the school with the Buffalo logo on it. And then we went to Kijabi, which was a three hour drive from Nairobi along the escarpment of the Great Rift Valley. Now you could have gone on the upper road. There's that option. The upper road being right up by the plateau. But we, for some reason, the escarpment was chosen more often than not, which was a very, very dangerous road, right at the edge of the Rift Valley Bank, right there. <laughs> Sometimes it was also weather. The weather determined if you're gonna go the upper road or the lower road, because if you were going the upper road and it has been pouring with rain or is raining, chances are you're not gonna get down to the campus on a very, very safe way because it is extremely muddy and uh, coming out of those muddy ridges and overturning your car, van, yeah, the chances are high. So in hindsight, I'm thinking it's probably what they did when they had us in the bus or in the van. They went the escarpment road, considering that if anything, there was too much rain, going up a gentle incline towards campus was a little bit safer than scooting down and skidding down muddy, muddy rivers, which you know, roads turn into rivers there when there's no tarmac. So yeah, that's my trip from Mombasa to Nairobi.
and I loved it. And if you're still here watching me chop away and yap away, thank you. Asante sana. And then being in a childish mood, because those are the memories I'm reliving right now, we used to say, Asante sana, squash banana. <laughs> like, what? What? Why? Why is it Asante sana, squash banana? Oh, goodness me. I mean, I like to reminisce, but then again, you know, <laughs> you ask yourself, huh? What did where'd that come from? But yeah, so thank you so much if you're still here. I really appreciate your time. And if you're just joining me after the timestamp and you've skipped forward, appreciate that you're here as well. And so far, I have not been pestered by any ants. They have been absolutely no nuisance in my hand at all, which is great because I could just yap away relive my nights on the Mombasa train, the Tongululu, and chop away at these dead roots here of my Garen Weaver. I haven't even started the leaf cleanup yet, and I'm wondering, I mean, I'm not going to be doing much at this point in time. I suppose I could see if I wanted to split it and get in there a little bit deeper, but then again, why? I am here now in the, almost the middle of August, so, um, I don't think it's such a smart idea to be taking pieces apart and then hoping that I can keep up with the watering and the happiness of this orchid. If I, for example, just have a little piece like this. I mean, you know, it's got its own roots, but wow, the maintenance on that? Mm -mm -mm. So I'm gonna keep it together, but I'm going to be a little bit more radical than I was last year with the cleanup. Yep. I did this last year as well, but not with a story. <laughs> I didn't know there would be any interest in the stories of Africa while messing around with orchids. I, I thought, no, you don't want to go there. You, you know, stick to the orchids, don't. But hey, the Easter story seemed to have been well received. And I thought, well, OK, then every once in a while, if I have something to do where I'm not having to concentrate and explain a lot of things, we can go and talk about Africa and all the fun stuff that happened back in those days when, honestly, I thought life was going to stay that way. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so you're here because you skipped the story, so I don't want to reminisce back on that. So now let's focus on the orchid. But I have done a pretty radical cleanup and I'm going to continue to do more really get into the gunk and the center of it here. Let me make sure I don't drop any necker beads, but really get into that. I didn't do that last year. And give this orchid a bit of a reset and then see if I can also spook the ants out of thinking, eh, we're not going back there again. This orchid is being taken care of, so <laughs> our home is forever destroyed. But I did want to point out that, yes, I have removed quite, quite a few good roots as well as bad roots because there was just no other way of getting through. And I've, you know, taken them back to a reasonable distance. The Garen Weaver roots being quite thin. So they're not near your classic standard sized roots. I'll be back. So I just washed my hands <laughs> before I show you the roots. So against the pot, this would be like the roots all blasted up and squashed up against the pot, but there is that fuzz around them as well. But they're not as fleshy, they're not as big. They are much more thinner in texture and can be mistaken for being dead, but they're not. So it's a bit different from the other ones that we see with a nice chubby fleshy root. So these are alive, but I did take them off because it, it wouldn't be a radical cleanup if I didn't take off roots radically. If you've been on my channel, you know that <coughs> I'm not shy when it comes to trimming roots, only if I have a healthy root system. Now, this root system wasn't exactly super healthy and it needed a lot of help and cleanup, but that's what we're doing this for. But I have roots that I can see that are branching. The only thing is you can't be as radical with regards to going in and taking out dead roots in one fail swoop when it comes to these guys because 
Like I said, they might look dead, but they're not. So it's all a little bit more of a fiddle and a look-see as to where dead roots are as opposed to live roots. And because I'm growing in inorganic media, I don't need to be so pedantic about getting every single dead root out. I mean, it's nice to be able to see what you're doing and be as careful and, you know, meticulous as possible while you're at it. But the inorganic media is not going to degrade. And if there is the occasional strand or deadness or whatever going on, not a problem with inorganic media. So this is now just for a little bit of aesthetic purposes and while I still talk to you. And it's a shame when you break a root tip. Nina, 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 stop. It was doing so well. Right, let me go, let me show you the, the new roots of the Garen Weaver. Right there, are skinny little things. And that's how they stay. The only thing that changes is they get more and more fuzz as they age. As you can see up here, there's a little bit more fuzz and it looks a little bit like the big brother of these little guys coming here. So yeah, Garen Weaver roots, skinny little things do not be too aggressive if you're unsure about is it alive or is it dead. It should come out like a typical orchid root with a strand like this. This is clearly dead. It does the same thing as with any other orchid root. So it's just very, very much skinnier and it's not as quickly and easy identifiable. Even the color, it can be brown, look dead, but it's not. It's just the nature of the beast. That's what they look like. And it is a branching root system, which also helps loads in being a little bit more aggressive with regards to cleaning up, seeing as the roots, when they're taken care of properly, which I need to do a lot more flushing for this one. So we can take advantage of that attribute as well. The next step here forward is to spray down the entire root bowl and get into the center of the orchid right there and get out the gunk. And I've still got ants going everywhere. I'm also going to be cleaning more of these sheaths out in the middle as best as I can. I've got a dead leaf happening over here. Let's see if I can get that off at the base or do I need to cut it? Quite frankly, I am not surprised it didn't bloom for me this year because of the fact that it didn't get much lovings but maybe this disturbance will do something and trigger a flower spike last year. I did do the cleanup last year in May. That was May of 2020. And then it did bloom for me during the summer, but you know, we're now in summer. So I'm behind, but that's okay. Honestly, if I can just get this one to, you know, love me back <clears throat> after my abuse, I'd be very, very happy about that. Yeah, so a little bit more cleanup and we're going to get the sprayer in there and that will also loosen up any more of those sheaths that I seem to struggle to be getting at. Got to be very careful with those root tips. There we go. Everything's cleaned up except for the leco. Oh boy, that's going to be a chore. <laughs> That'll be tomorrow with a podcast of sorts. But look at this. So looking a lot better, a lot cleaner. And um, I tried to convince some ants that are still hanging on, insisting that this is their home, that it is not their home in actual fact anymore because I went to the kitchen and really washed the orchids down. And yet there are still some diehards in here that seem to think they know better, but anyway, it's up to me to do better by this orchid. The only reason that there we go. You see, they still think, oh, my pot, home sweet home. No, it's not your sweet home. No, but you see, the thing is that um, <clears throat> ants in a semi-hydro pot creating a nest is a clear sign I didn't do my job very well for this orchid. I didn't flush enough. There should be no reason why ants even get a hold of an orchid pot. They can visit 
But to create a nest of this magnitude with so many in there, they were clearly very happy in the drier conditions. My Phragmopedium, not so much. We're gonna change that now. And we're going full on with small lecker. And this pot is gonna probably take up the rest of my small lecker, which means more shopping. Back into the middle she goes. And then I'm just going to fill up with lecker and then eventually shake her and slowly raise her up into her final position in the pot. One unceremonious flush through, straight over the top, seeing as this orchid is sometimes submerged where it lives, submerged in water. No issues here at all. I have also left it quite low in the pot. Sometimes when they do really well, they will start lifting themselves out of the pot based on the root growth. But for now, I'm also going to prepare myself a nice batch of seaweed and cow mag, and then I'm going to soak the pot for a couple of hours just with that concentration and hope that she recovers and forgives me. And then if there are any more pedantic ants in there that think they can go back and move back in, I think I might have convinced them that this is not their home anymore by flooding the pot one more time. I'm going to thank you right here and right now if you've made it this far without using the timestamps. <laughs> I hope that you enjoyed joining me on the train from Mombasa to Nairobi. If you got a little bit of the flair, if you managed to see some animals, enjoyed the conversation and all that good stuff, I hope that you will let me know in the comments below what you thought of our trip today and well, also what you thought of Garen Weaver as company. I think he is great company. It is not his fault that he looks like this. It is completely and utterly my doing. So I thoroughly enjoyed having you along. I thoroughly enjoyed also taking you along for the adventure of the Chongululu, the Mombasa train. I hope you have yourself a wonderful day, Kwaheri Sana. Stay safe and take care.